I interrupt this video for a special shout out to you, the viewers, for making the previous DVD review, The Born Identity, the most watched review in the history of low budget reviews. Once again, thank you. However, not everyone liked this video. I received this comment. The music you're talking is too loud and distracting. It'd be more useful to put up images that coincide with the topics you're talking about. Otherwise, it's just a long ramble. So just to prove that I listened to comments, there will be no background music for this video, and I'll keep the length of this video to 15 minutes. So sorry for uh, wasting like 45 seconds of this video with this. Uh, but uh, anyway, on with the video. On May 24th, 1965, John Christopher Riley was born in Chicago, Illinois, the fifth of six children, the son of the owner of an industrial linen supply company. Riley grew up in the Chicago Lawn neighborhood and had a mischievous childhood, once stealing 500 boxes of sugar corn pops from a freight train. He attended Brother Rice High School and later DePaul University, which was his alma mater. In 1989, Riley made his film debut in the Brian De Palma war film, Casualties of War, as Private First Class Herbert Hatcher. Next, he played a monk in We're No Angels, also released in 1989. He also played Buck, a NASCAR crew member in Days of Thunder, released in 1990. He played an Irish hoodlum named Steve McGuire in the crime film State of Grace, uh, also released in 1990, which starred Sean Penn. He played Jimmy Hoffa's associate in Hoffa, released in 1992, who later testifies against Hoffa. Riley had, had a supporting role in Was Eating Gilbert Grape, released in 1993, as one of the titular character's friends. His next role was in The River Wild, released in 1994. Here, Riley appeared alongside Kevin Bacon as a pair of criminals who terrorized a family during a rafting trip. In 1995, Riley appeared in Dolores Claiborne as a police constable and in Georgia as a drug-addicted drummer. In Paul Thomas Anderson's directorial debut, Hard Eight, which was released in 1996, Riley played a homeless man. He also appeared in Boogie Nights, uh, released in 1997, which also was directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, playing a pornographic actor. And he also appeared in as a religious police officer in Magnolia, released in 1999. He also appeared in the independent war film The Settlement, also released in 1999, which was not well, well received by critics. He played one of the newspaper managing editors in Never Been Kissed, also released in 1999. And he also played fictional baseball catcher Sam Raimi in the sports drama for the Love of the Game, also released in 1999. Riley's only film in 2000 was The Perfect Storm, which featured him as a veteran crew member on the Andrea Gale fishing vessel, which gets caught in the 1991 Perfect Storm. Riley played director Mac Forsyth in The Anniversary Party, released in 2001, directed by Jennifer Jason Leigh and Alan Cumming. Riley next played a stoner husband in a lackluster match to Jennifer Aniston's character in The Good Girl, released in 2002. Later that year, he appeared in three of the year's Academy Award for Best Picture nominees, Chicago, released in 2002, Gangs of New York, also released in 2002, and The Hours, also released in 2002. In Chicago, he played Amos Hart, Roxanne's husband and was nominated for Best Supporting Actor. In Gangs of New York, he played a corrupt constable, Happy Jack Mulraney, and in The Hours, he played the husband to Julianne Moore's character. He also appeared as a monk in Anger Management, released in 2003. Riley appeared in the Howard Hughes biopic The Aviator, released in 2004, as the business partner of Hughes. Although he played supporting roles in movies up to this point, he played the lead role in The Criminal, also released in 2004, a film which got generally positive reviews. He next played the lead in one of Miranda July's short films, Are You the Favorite Person of Anybody, released in 2005. He also 
appeared in Dark Water, also released in 2005, which starred Jennifer Connelly. Now Riley started to branch into comedy. He co-starred in Talladega Nights, The Battle of Ricky Bobby, released in 2006, as the best friend and teammate of the title character, played by Will Ferrell. He appeared in the in Robert Altman's uh, Prairie Home Companion, uh, also released in 2006, and made a cameo in, tena- as, in Tenacious D's uh, In the Pick of Destiny, re- also released in 2006, as a sc- Sasquatch. Riley had a recurring role on Tim and Eric's awesome show, Great Job, from 2007 to 2010, as the inept doctor and television presenter, Dr. Steve Rule. The role led to a spin-off series, Check It Out with Steve Rule, uh, which aired from 2010 to 2016. In 2007, Riley starred as Dewey Cox in the parody biopic, Walk Hard, The Dewey Cox Story. Now I have to help people with my music. Like your family? No. The guy who brought you Talladega Nights, Knocked Up, and Superbad invite you to meet Dewey Cox. Walk hard. <laughs> hard. It's the devil's music! This holiday season, there's a rift between the Beatles. I've got a song about an octopus. <laughs> I like the little one. Walk hard. The Dewey Cox story. Rated R. The movie opens in Springbury, Alabama in 1946, where a 10-year-old Dewey Cox, who's played by John C. Riley, although the young Dewey Cox is played by Connor Rayburn, plays with his brother Nate. Although he's worried about the danger of machetes, the two have a machete fight, and Dewey cuts his brother in half. The trauma caused him to lose his sense of smell. His father, played by Raymond J. Barry, says that the wrong son died. Dewey meets a blues guitarist, and apparently his life experience instilled him with a natural affinity for playing the blues. A few years later, Dewey performs at a school talent show, where he pleases the crowd with his song, Take My Hand, but his father thinks it's the devil's music and kicks him out of the house. Thus, he leaves home at 14 with his 12-year-old girlfriend, Edith, played by Kirsten Wig. Kirsten Wig, that sounds familiar. Oh, yes, the wife from uh, Extract. Uh, anyway, they soon marry and have a baby. Dewey is employed at an all-black nightclub as a janitor. He replaces Bobby Shad on stage and impresses Hasidic Jew record executive Lahaim, played by uh, the late Harold Ramis. Auditioning for a record company executive, he performs That's Amore, and being berated by the same executive, he performs Walk Hard, a song inspired by a speech he gave Edith. The song becomes a hit, and Dewey Cox soon becomes a rock star. He performs his first concert with Elvis Presley, Buddy Holly, and the Big Bopper. Uh, He's introduced to marijuana by his drummer Sam, played by Tim Meadows, and participates in an orgy. Dewey's father informs him that his mother, played by Margot Martindale, has died while dancing to Dewey's song and blames Dewey's music for her death. Uh, Dewey finds Sam using cocaine and partakes in it, distraught over his mother's death. Darlene Madison, played by Jenna Fisher, who is a choir girl who performs duets with Dewey, form a relationship. Dewey marries Darlene while still married to Edith. This bigamy causes both women to leave him, after which Dewey purchases drugs from an undercover cop. After he serves time in prison prison and rehab, Darlene returns to him. In Dewey Cox's middle period, his lyrics are compared to Bob Dylan's lyrics. When interviews ask him about it, he angrily denies it. The couple moved to Berkeley, California in 1966 during the counterculture movement, where Dewey performed songs about injustices to midgets. On a band visit to India, Dewey drops acid with the Beatles, which leads to a yellow submarine-esque hallucination. Dewey becomes consumed with creating his masterpiece, Black Sheep. Uh, The band resents his insane musical style, and he essentially fires them. He starts to abuse drugs, and high on PCP, he assaults several cops and ends up in jail. As a result, Darlene leaves him for Glenn Campbell. A prison stint leads to rehab, and during rehab, he's visited by the ghost of Nate, who's now played by, uh, older Nate is played by Jonah Hill, who ridicules his self-pity and tells him to start writing songs again. 
He still can't write songs, but his manager lands him a gig hosting a variety TV show, uh, which does poorly against the Incredible Hulk, which is kind of weird. It's, well, it's supposed to be a CBS variety show, but the Hulk aired on CBS, so I don't know what that means. Um, he is unable to compose a masterpiece for his brother, who reappears and urges Dewey to reconcile with his father. Dewey and his father end up dueling, dueling with machetes. Despite having trained years for the moment, his father cuts himself in half. He then forgives Dewey for Nate's death, urges him to be a better father, and dies. A distraught Dewey pulls out every sink and destroys almost everything in his home. Dewey is approached by one of his illegitimate children, and in spite of resenting having custody forced on him, he decides to reconnect with his many offspring. In 1992, a divorced Darlene returns to him. He regains his sense of smell and remarries Darlene. In 2007, Lahayim's uh, son, Dreidel, informs Dewey of his popularity with young listeners through rap, lap, rapper Little Nutsack's sampling of Walk Hard. Dewey learns that he is to receive a Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, they don't want him to sing a song at the ceremony, but Dewey is reluctant. But with his family's support, he reunites with his band and fi is finally able to create uh, one great masterpiece, summing up his entire life with his final song, Beautiful Ride, which he performs at the ceremony. Uh, and Tyler Card reveals that Dewey died three minutes after his final performance. A post credit scene is a short clip of the actual Dewey Cox, still played by John C. Riley. This movie is essentially a parody of a musical biopic, and in many ways it invites comparison to some of the music-related mockumentaries of the past, including uh, Walk the Line and Ray. Uh, so what was the first um, parody of a rock documentary? Probably The Ruddles. So in 1978, Eric Idle and Gary Weiss directed The Ruddles, which expanded upon a segment Idol originally made for Rutland Weekend Television in 1976. The movie was basically a parody of the Beatles. Although the idea was not necessarily original, the parodies were excellent. So you have like, um, Hold My Hand became, uh, well, I Want to Hold Your Hand became Hold My Hand, and, um, Yellow Submarine became Yellow Submarine Sandwich. I, I Am the Walrus became Piggy in the Middle. And yeah, like Get Back became Get Up and Go. So it was, it was very funny. Um, so in the 1960s, Michael McKeon and David L. Lander met up at Carnegie Mellon University, which was at the time Carnegie Tech, during which they developed the characters of Lenny and Squiggy. They moved to Los Angeles, where they joined the Credibility Gap and later joined the cast of Laverne Shirley in 1976 as Lenny and Squiggy. The popularity of the show and of their characters spawned a band called Lenny and the Squig Tones. The duo released an album in 1979 and featured Christopher Guest on guitar, credited as Nigel Tufnell. In 1983, Laverne and Shirley was canceled, uh, leaving McKeon Freed to develop other projects. So McKeon, Guest, and Harry Shearer formed the fictional band Spinal Tap, which was featured in the 1984 mockumentary This is Spinal Tap. According to the movie, David St. Hubbins, uh, played by McKeon, and Nigel Tufnell, played by Guest, team up and formed a band, uh, and they, after several name changes, they called themselves the Thamesmen. In the British Invasion period, they had several hits, including Gimme Some Money and Cups and Cakes. Um, so they, they then teamed up with uh, Derek Smalls, played by uh, Harry Shearer, and... Then, in the psychedelic era, they renamed themselves Spinal Tap and had the international hit Listen to the Flower People. At some point, they rebranded themselves as a heavy metal outfit and had several albums with the core lineup of St. Hubbins, Tufnell, and Dar Derek Smalls, while also going through several keyboard players and drummers, and the drummers invariably die. Um... The movie chronicles Spinal Tap during their 1982 North American tour, in which the band suffers commercial decline, including declining attendance at concerts, an album which the record company will not release because of its controversial cover, and band infighting, which culminates in Tufnell temporarily leaving the band. 
But when they find out Sex Farm Woman, uh, that's the Spinal Tap version of Sex Farm Woman, is number five in Japan, they forget their differences and tour the land of the rising sun, this time with Joe Mama Besser as their drummer, replacing Mick Shrimpton, who spontaneously combusted on stage. While this movie is very funny, and the movie would not be memorable otherwise, think of all the things they parody here. And this is a, sh a, a short list of, of things that they parodied in this movie. Um, number one, old bands reinventing themselves. I'm not sure who they're referring to, but it could be Status Quo, who uh, went from being a psychedelic band to rebranding themselves as a, a blues boogie band. Um, number two, drummers dying. Uh, while there are many examples, I think John Bonham is the prime example. And, uh, so choked on his own vomit, that could be an example of John Bonham or, uh, say, Bon Scott of ACDC. Number three, controversial album covers where popular bands get away with some things that less popular bands can't. Um, number four, bands in decline suddenly find themselves big in Japan. Uh, I couldn't think of any other example well, there's some heavy metal bands that are that are examples of this there's also enough is enough they they can't get rest in the united states but they're popular in japan um so the success of spinal tap began another parody band being spawned by the same lineup of mckeon guest and Shearer. this time the folksman while there were sporadic appearances by this parody band over the year, especially in a 1984 Saturday Night Live appearance, they were heavily featured in the 2003 mockumentary A Mighty Wind, which did for folk music what Spinal Tap did for heavy metal. In Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story, it seemed that the screenwriters wanted to parody as many different musical genres that they could get away with. Um, in the beginning, Dewey Cox is a rockabilly slash country crossover artist, a la Elvis Presley, Carl Perkins, and Roy Orbison. But then he morphs into a 1960s style folk artist like Bob Dylan, and then he becomes a complex artist trying to compose a masterpiece, Shades of Brian Wilson and Smile, for example. Um, and like all veteran artists spinning their wheels, he gets his own 1970s variety show. Then, when he's old and fatness, and essentially uh, retired from the music industry and a family man, a rap artist samples his work, leading to renewed popularity. Walk Hard was released in 2007 and apparently heavily references and therefore parodies the biopics Walk the Line, uh, which is the Johnny Cash movie, and Ray, the, the Ray Charles movie. Um, the part where he loses his sense of smell is a reference to Ray, well, that somewhat dates the movie. It also does a good job of parodying these films from Boyhood Tragedy, A Loner Who Leaves Home, Seeking Solace in His Music, this kind of like Walk the Line. He faces success, adversity, and a woman leaving him and coming back to him based on his life choices. Although the movie was written by Judd Apatow and J Jake Kasten, uh, the same team that made Superbad Knocked Up it does not rely exclusively on gross-out humor, and the humor here is observational and self-parodying. And what can be said about John C. Riley's performance? Um, as he does with, with his Dr. Steve Brule character, he plays an ignorant doofus out of touch with the world around him. While he marries Darlene, while still married to his first wife, I, I think we're actually supposed to believe that his behavior... Uh, that he didn't know this behavior was illegal, or maybe he knows it and he thought that he could be exempt because he's rich and famous. Uh, the rest of the cast was good. I can't think of anybody who who performed their role badly. Uh, the musical numbers are excellent, and uh, they stand in their own right. Um, so I should um, this is a, I should say something about the the rating of this movie. This movie is rated R for sexual content, graphic nudity, uh, drug use, and language. Uh, this, although we, we could like list the scenes uh, that got it this rating, uh, I, I think I'll, I will avoid that for, for the time being. Uh, there's even a scene where a man's penis is shown, and you see it again in a flashback back sequence uh, when Dewey is performing Beautiful Ride. Uh, yeah, the content which gave this movie a well-deserved R rating is pretty funny. And so as long as you know that it's not a family-friendly movie, it's kind of funny. Um, in summation, Walk Hard, The Dewey Cox Story, 
um, is a worthy addition to the canon of great music-related parodies, one that includes Spinal Tap, A Mighty Wind, That Thing You Do, The Ruddles, Pop Star, and many others. I may have to go back and watch the Walk the Line Raid. So I never saw these movies. So I may have to go back and watch Walk the Line Raid to fully appreciate this movie. But I don't think it relies too heavily in parodying those, those two movies. Although not a classic, it allows Riley to shine. Um, so it's like one of the... Riley is a, a... Who basically cut his teeth being a, a supporting actor. Here he, he stars in the movie and... It really allows uh, Riley to shine here. It is well written, and the music is good. I give this movie an 8 out of 10. This DVD has a lot of features. It has a commentary with Jake Katzen, Joe, Judd Apatow, John C. Riley, and Lou Morton. It also has full song performances and deleted and extended scenes. There's also some deleted lines. There's a documentary called The Music of Walk Hard, The Dewey Cox Story, a documentary on the real Dewey Cox, and trailers. For subtitles, there's a plethora of options. There's English, English in, uh, subtitled commentary, English S SDH, which is subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing. Um, so this just uh, puts subtitles under the actors actually speaking them. Uh, there's also... Um, Subtitles in Czech, Hungarian, Polish, Dutch, Dutch subtitle commentary, uh, Arabic, and Bulgarian. You can set it up for English, English audio descriptive service, or dubbed into Czech, Hungarian, or Polish. You can select individual scenes or watch the entire movie. The foreign language options alone make the DVD features a compelling reason to buy the DVD, so, yeah. Oh, I noticed they didn't have Spanish here. That's kind of interesting. Oh, yeah. But anyway, I guess, like, if, I don't know, if if you, if you, if you speak Spanish is your, your main language, then you're kind of out of luck here. But anyway, there's a lot of features. In conclusion, Walk Hard, The Dewey Cox Story, is a solid movie, and it's chocked full of DVD features. This is a good purchase of a largely forgotten movie, and as of 2023, uh, this 2007 movie is pretty, by and large forgotten. And for this reason, I strongly recommend this DVD. Well, that's it for this DVD review. I just got in another Will Ferrell 3 pack, so I'll start watching these movies, starting with Talladega Nights. Like and comment on this channel, and subscribe so you'll be informed of the latest low-budget review. As always, thanks for watching.